healthcare and financial technology. His experience includes security and compliance program development and management, process automation and efficiency, security architecture, and vulnerability and risk management. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer, uh, computer engineering and a master's degree in management information systems as well as CISSP and CEA certification. He is heavily involved in the tech community of Central Arkansas as a mentor with the Venture Center, uh, a game master for Jolt, an organizer for the Central Arkansas Hackers Group, and an industry advisor, board member for Arkansas Tech University and Philander Smith College. Please welcome Chris Rock. All right, so um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of the hacker mindset and really what the guy on the other side of the screen, or the gal on the other side of the screen, uh, is that we're trying to combat against. So hopefully that will help you uh, understand it a little bit as you are getting you know, phishing emails or seeing uh, news articles about hacking or getting your photo taken while you're giving a talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you'll have a little bit better understanding about that. Um, as you look at that. I know a lot of people think about it and they're just perplexed at what's going on. There are a few key things that differentiate people that do this from, from you or I. Uh, I'm going to go through those. Um, obligatory slide that actually I talked about. Um, so Shell will appreciate this. I'm going to tell a story. So, <laughs> um, so this is Enigma. And you can see he's got a cool name and he's wearing a hoodie. So obviously, he's a leap hacker. <coughs> so um, there's a, a, a sort of cultural understanding of what it means to be a hacker. And so your hacker starter kit comes with a hoodie. <laughs> so now you have many hoodies, right? <laughs> um, comes with a hoodie. Also comes with a ski mask. Because every picture you see of a hacker in a news article is some dude in a hoodie, and he has a ski mask on. There's a there's a, a, a rabid debate in the cybersecurity world about is it better to have the ski mask with three holes in it or just a big face hole in it. Um, <laughs> that's just unsolved at this point. Uh, he's also got a pretty sweet techno playlist that he listens to at the loudest volume that his uh, iPhone or Android phone or whatever consume will allow him to uh, listen to that at. And the most important part, doesn't shower that out. So, that one works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I mean, having been up here in 125 people during Joe on a weekend, I can tell you there are people that don't shower out. <laughs> um, which leads into what this really is, is this is a little bit more of a stereotype of a good guy than it is the bad guy. Um, we've got a lot of, of subculture references and subculture um, um, things that people in the security community will <coughs> adhere to. And there's, you know, some of them are jokes, some of them are realistic. The hoodie, uh, almost everybody in information security has a hoodie of some point. Like somebody's a, you know, if they're a hands-on keyboard person, uh, they, they, you know, their uh, uh, hoodies are a favorite uh, clothing item of theirs. Um, there's a, just a lot of uh, quirkiness in that community because a lot of the people are very quirky. Um, you want that. You want those people that are a little different. Um, they're usually the ones that understand things a little bit better. They're, uh, they're more you know, looking for ways to make things work. They want to understand things better. Um, they kind of live outside the norms of everything we do. So you see people you know, that look a, a, a lot different than the hoodie. Uh, the techno playlist and the, the, the lack of showering are the first two being the most common. Um, and we get that a lot from our culture, our pop culture references. So does everybody know where this is from? Okay. Who does? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> so this is kind of the first, uh, one, at least one of the first, I think it was really the first pop culture hacker movie that we saw. And if you didn't see it, so that's uh, Ben Gillette from Penn and Teller. He played a role in this. I uh, forgot what the guy's name is over here, but he was like a like a big 80s, 90s kind of B-list actor. He was in Short Circuit and all that. But in this, he plays a guy named The Plague. And I always laugh because Penn always calls him Mr. The Plague, and he just, he's, he's just The Plague. <laughs> um, 
but so he plays this kind of arch uh, hacker role where he is God and he knows everything and he's condescending to everyone around him and he styles himself in a certain way. He's got the ponytail. He's got the the clothes that don't look like anything else in the company. He rolls into a corporate board meeting on a scooter. You know, all sorts of those little weird quirky things. And that's really uh, more the idea of what the good guys look like. If you, you know, if you did go to DEF CON you did that last week. There you go. So if you went to DEF CON last week, you'll see a lot of that kind of stuff there. You know, these quirky people with colored hair and sort of all stand out in their own crowd. Um, so like I said, this is a little bit more of what the, what the good guys are going to look like. On the bad guy side, and I really hate to go good guy, bad guy, because it's not really that easy of a dichotomy. But it's the easiest way to kind of sum this up and, and present it this way. Um, but really, there's a whole spectrum of this. And as you can see on the bottom left here, uh, we've got script kiddies uh, all the way up to the top right of nation state. Um, script kiddies is kind of a derogatory term that we used to talk about people who uh, really don't know what they're doing. They're just copying and pasting. Um, you know, if you're a developer, you might know the concept of copying and pasting from uh, uh, it Stack Overflow or GitHub or something like that. Um, there's kind of the same concept in here. You know, they'll find some code somewhere, they'll throw it in. They may be able to wrangle it a little bit, but they really don't understand how things go. Um, so they're just trying to copy and paste and throw stuff in there. Doesn't mean they can't get better. But that's where they are at this point, and it's it's a, it's a bit derogatory. Some people actually take it as a um, uh, you know to describe themselves as I'm new into this, and that's kind of what level I am. So they don't they're not deriding themselves, but when people who know what they're doing talk about script keys, it's typically derogatory. When we talk about nation states, though, we're talking about um, we're talking about like usually military units or state organized units. Uh, we have them. China has them. North Korea has them. Iran has them. Uh, Israel has them, France has them, the UK has them. So it's not necessarily that they're always good or always bad, depending on whose side you're on. You know, we're obviously going to say, you know, most of us are going to say that the US is the good guys and the Chinese are the bad guys in this case, the North Koreans are the bad guys, the Iranians are the bad guys, the Israelis are the good guys, the British are the good guys. But it can be a little nebulous depending on which side you're on and kind of your belief system. But in general, those nation state attackers are going to be a lot better organized, they've got a lot more structure. Um, think about it like instead of one guy just talking away at a computer, you've got some guy coming in you know, with a cup of coffee sitting under the desk and let another guy leave his shift. So you know, somebody's coming in for the next shift in the hacker, you know, the North Korean hacker community with whatever, you know, their bowl of kimchi or whatever they bring in in the morning <laughs> uh, when they come in. Um, uh, sorry about the bad cultural <laughs> reference <laughs> ahead of time. Um, but it's a lot more organized. They have the ability to pay people, so they've got a lot smarter people. There's a lot more structure around. And then you've got everything in between there. Commoditized attacks. Um, you know, think about installing Word software and creating documents. You know, you can do the same thing in uh, several of the areas of malware that we we'll talked about. Uh, and then organized crime is kind of similar to your nation state, but a little bit less organized and a little bit less uh, uh, skilled. So they're, they're kind of trying to act in the same way, but they just don't have the, uh, the skills to do that. So uh, in small businesses, we're usually looking towards the bottom of this too. Nation state attackers really aren't going against small businesses uh, on, a, on a large scale. Uh, organized crime, usually they're looking at a little bit larger, but they'll, you know, sometimes, um, you know, it really doesn't matter who they're trying to get. Um, a lot of times this is kind of a, what, what I call spray and pray. You just put something out there and see who it's going to hit and see what you can get. Uh, so very opportunistic. Um, but in reality, this is the guy that's coming after you. So this is the guy, Sergey. So not to be confused with Vlad. Um, actually, I do use some Vlad references. <laughs> so I, and I, I, I joke with Matt a little bit. Um, one of the guys that we used to work with at FIS uh, very much would fit a lot of the same stereotypes. And he got a lot of his good guy skills through doing the same stuff. So um, it you know, doesn't automatically mean you're going to be a bad guy if you uh, squat and wear a track suit and from Eastern Europe. But typically, um, and I, I use this example, it's not totally you know, Eastern Europe or anything, but um, anybody from a disadvantaged part of the world. Um, with access to a little bit of technology and a little bit of skill uh, is probably our worst adversary in small businesses because 
they're the ones that are looking for what they can do the quickest um, with the least amount of skill to get more money than they would have, wouldn't be able to um, do a regular job. I think I see a big person here. Anyway, so survey is uh, most like from Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe uh, from a former Soviet Republic or from Russia uh, itself. Uh, he probably has very little formal education. He's very much self-taught. Uh, he's self-taught in a way that really is not, you know, you can't go and put that on a resume and get a job somewhere. Probably doesn't have a lot of connections in his home country either, so he doesn't have an easy way into uh, a great job there. Um, he might be able to get like a factory job or a blue collar job, but he's not really interested in that. So he goes this route. Survey's motivations <laughs> are money. Sergey wants money. He's not really out there uh, for the craft and the skill. He's looking for some way that he can get money. And I like to say he's not um, he's not Elon Musk. He's not Jeff Bezos trying to expand what they do. You know, he's not trying to build an online uh, retail giant or cool electric cars or spaceships. He's the sham wow guy. He's just trying to pitch you crap on TV and get you money. So how does he get that? You probably recognize all of these things. You've heard of them before. Uh, he's going to try to extort you through ransomware. Um, encrypt your files, lock them away from your use, and ask you um, to pay him money to get back to him. He's going to try to con you into sending it directly through something like a business email compromise uh, for a small business or some other sort of social engineering attack to get you to send him money directly. Somewhere. He's going to con you into giving you access to his bank through phishing. You know, he's going to develop a, <coughs> a uh, attack that um, cons you into entering your bank credentials into some website that he controls. He's going to install software on your computer through some sort of backdoor means. He's going to send you some sort of malware in an email or, or get you to go to a website that has malware on it so that he can install software on your computer that will give him backdoor access into your bank. Uh, he's going to use those same means to, that he used to install the software um, to get into your bank but he might install bot software on your computer so that he can get access into your computer to either do nefarious things himself or sell that time or sell that computing power to other people who want to do nefarious things like send out spam, send out scams, or perform strictly denial of service attacks. That's the one that really gets me because what he's basically doing is maliciously commoditizing computer power from the 50s and 60s. You know, if you remember old time sharing systems like mainframes where you had to share all that, you paid by the minute or something, he's basically commoditized the, the evil portion of that, something that's been around forever. Uh, or he's just going to fly out still and sell your information. He's going to hack into a service that you own or a service that you, or that you use. He's going to get your sensitive information like your passwords, your credit card information. He's going to sell that on the dark web probably for very little amount of money for your specific uh, sensitive information, but when he gets that in mass, you know, he gets uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> All right, survey is resourceful as well. Remember I said he, uh, he doesn't have the connections or the means, but I didn't say he was dumb. He learns a lot on his own, uh, and in that, um, he is looking for ways to do something that gets him money um, that he, uh, you know, might not be able to do ordinarily. Um, but in this case, he's going to favor simplicity over complexity. So uh, rather than you know somebody trying to create the perfect evil hack or something like Mr. the Plague before would have been, um, you know, in a kind of a condescending godlike role. Uh, Sergey is just trying to get a buck, so he really doesn't care if it's dirty or clean or what. Um, he's going to look for something that's easy to do over something that's going to take, you know, that's going to be a Rube Goldberg machine or the old mousetrap thing. He's looking for a quick return on that investment, so the faster he can get the money, the better, the less time he has to spend on it. Does that sound familiar for any entrepreneurs out there? You know, you're looking for a reasonably quick way to get a return on your investment. You know, you don't want to... Um, build something that's going to be wholly elaborate and difficult to sell. You want to sell something that's going to be easy to install. Uh, I'm sure uh, Walter doesn't want to build the most complex laser to install on a 
movie theater and he wants something that's going to go in with a quick install package that he doesn't have to be there specifically. He's, uh, he's going to use older, uh, or he's going to use readily available tools. He's going to use open source tools that are available out there. He's going to use older exploits. He's not looking for that uh, fancy new zero day that hasn't been discovered by anybody or hasn't been patched. He's going to use something that's two to three years old and might be part of a common hacking tool that's out there because it's easy to use, it's been packaged, it's been worked out, there's not any ifs in it, he knows what it's gonna do, and it's been proven. Uh, and one of the most important things that he thinks about is what can I do with this, not what should I do with this. This is one of the biggest things I've seen in my years of doing testing. Um, I used to work a lot with Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government entity, and I, could not tell you how many times I heard, but it's not supposed to do that. And my response was always, I don't care, it does. And that allowed me to get in, and that allowed me to, to exfiltrate 30 million in social security numbers or something like that. So it really doesn't matter what it's supposed to do, it matters what it can do. This is very much a hacker mindset, not from the evil, malicious computer hacker, but just from the generic view of that term in I'm going to take something and I'm going to use it the way it wasn't intended because I want to use it that way. So think about it like a you know home automation hack. You not drill holes in your wall or cut holes in your wall to put a touch screen in there and install uh, connected light bulbs and, and power um, plugs everywhere so you can touch on the screen to turn your lights on, turn your um, turn your thermostat down, or lock and unlock the door, or look at the camera that's looking in your front yard. You know you'd be considered a home automation hacker in that standpoint. You're not doing anything malicious, but you're still called a hack. That's the mindset that he has. Uh, and he likes to use PetCat as much as possible. You might know what PetCat means. Yeah, it's that's a, so problem exists between keyboard and chair. So <laughs> it's one of those things that a lot of help desk folks or our IT support people would throw into a ticket. Uh, and you know, years ago, that really meant this is a user error, you know, the user scan, or something like that. So what he's trying to do is, in that case, he's trying to use the person. He's trying to use your own thought processes against you, and that's really where, when he's fishing or when he's trying to con you into going somewhere or con you into sending money, he's trying to use your own brain against you. So what does that mean? Sergey likes to fish. That's like if you look up who his boss is and send them an email saying I'm your boss or something like that. Yep, that is, uh, that is the definition of business email compromise. <laughs> a very, very, uh, very uh, simple definition, but that's the, that's the definition of that. Um, so in this case, uh, Sergey likes to fish, but Sergey generally likes social engineering because he's going against the small businesses. Um, and really, anybody that he goes against, it's easier to hit you than it is to hit the technology. So he's, he has an easier time conning you into doing things or tricking you into doing things uh, than he does getting past whatever technology is And he does that uh, using psychology. And this isn't so much what Sergey thinks, but this is what Sergey wants you to think. So first uh, up in the top three, these are the three most common uh, emotions that he's going to use against you in a business standpoint. So if he's sending you an email in business, he's trying to use fear, urgency, and authority. So fear that something bad is going to happen to you, fear that you're going to lose some standing, fear that you're going to lose a credential. Uh, urgency, this needs to be done within 24 hours, this needs to be done now, or that bad thing is going to happen to you. And authority, I am an authority figure such as the IRS or law enforcement, or I am the uh, certifying authority for your career field, I am the Department of Labor, uh, this industry board or something, uh, and uh, if you don't do this thing that I've tried to uh, use fear against you in, then you're going to lose your ability to do that, or you're going to lose your freedom, or you're going to be arrested. Or something. And I joke, I walked up here and I, I talked to, uh, I was talking to Ashley, and, and as I'm sitting down in my office on the third floor, uh, I got a phone call that I just let go to voicemail, and it told me that my social security number had been used in a fraud and uh, there was a warrant out for my arrest. And it was all in a nice computerized voice and everything. And I told Ashley, I kind of have scam FOMO if I see somebody else getting those and I'm not getting them. 
because I want to get those scams and see those because I will file those away and I use those when I'm presenting to clients to say, look, this is what is out there now. This is what the tactics that they're trying to use to attack you. So if I don't see those coming directly to me, I kind of feel left out like I'm not involved enough for them to try to scam me. Uh, the last two uh, are probably a little bit more well known if uh, people are coming after you or our Sergey is coming after you individually, he's likely to use helpfulness and hope more often than he is to use the other things. Uh, and so helpfulness is the, you know, the idea that we as humans want to help other people. Um, the, the best one I can use is my grandfather got a call several years ago and said, hi, I'm your oldest grandson, me. I am trapped in London, I've lost my passport and I'm out of money, can you wire me some money? And he says, well, uh, I didn't know you were in London, uh, let me let you talk to your dad. <laughs> so he hands the phone over to my dad, and he said as soon as he handed it over, all you hear is play. <laughs> so uh, the helpfulness side really targets a lot of older people, a lot of demographics that are you know, more likely to help, generally trying to calm the old people into uh, being helpful for a relative or some sort of um, some other person that they would be in years of uh, And hope everybody's got the Nigerian currency mails have they? It's a great email. Or the internet lottery, or Bill Gates is gonna send you $5 for every time you forward this. I mean, that's <laughs> been going around for forever. Uh, there was some the, on Craigslist, they would post an ad, you can put a logo on your car. Yeah, yeah. And, you know. Yep, there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of those scams going around. Uh, Okay. 
US and in some countries like you don't know how their power is like this one guy they found and his relative was like someone in political position and he notified yeah. him the guy changed his name and moved on hacking something else and then they eventually found him later. But. Yep, and when we're talking about people in other countries too, it's it's harder for what we think of as law enforcement to interact there because our law enforcement is so different than other countries. You know, we have a very even in Western Europe we don't have the same um, type of legal system that say France or Germany does. Um, we have one that's very much like Britain, which is a lot different than the other ones. And you get to Eastern Europe and there's a lot more tribalism like that. Uh, and then other countries that are you know, even more and I say tribal not in a negative way, but it's more kind of like a clan sort of thing. So if you want to think of like Scottish clans versus Afghan tribes, but um, it's just a lot more, a lot different reality that we don't often get in the United States unless you've been exposed to that, um, you know, through some means or another. We look at the world through our, you know, U.S. colored glasses, but it's it's not always the same. So um, one thing that's important for the Venture Center folks um, is that uh, Sergey is enterprising. So he sees that, he develops what he's doing. He sees, I can make money off of lesser criminals. And this is where he will go from being a script websites uh, and setting up uh, Bitcoin wallets and things like that. And he builds that into more of an automated, repeatable process so that he can develop software around that. Uh, which very much mimics how our software development community works too. You have a problem, you fix it, you think, hey, I could sell this to other people who have the same problem. So in this way, Sergey is really not that much different uh, than anybody else. After he packages up, he might actually even provide help desk and support. Uh, there are plenty of um, exploit kits out there that do offer that and when law enforcement or, or security researchers find this, they're kind of uh, taken aback. Um, they're kind of taken aback um, to uh, how developed that software is so that when you're connected to your bank, um, it can piggyback on your connection and it can you know, do things that uh, you know, transfer money out of your account or um, create you know, new logins or something so somebody else can get in there. Um, but do things nefarious um, while you're in your bank and not seeing any of this happen. You know, sometimes they would do the work on the back end, but they're still presenting to you the same numbers that you saw when you first logged in. So your account may be empty, but it's still showing you the $3,000 that you think it's supposed to be in. Um, those are probably the longest standing ones. Uh, there's phishing kits as well. There's a lot of these where they'll develop a self-contained back end uh, so that when you get that phishing email, you click on that, you're going to this very curated uh, web page that looks like it's a Bank of America login or an Office 365 login. Dropbox log. Uh, more recently, we've seen ransomware doing this. Um, ransomware is a, 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 a great example of late where people do this kind of on their own and they're sending all this out and they're coordinating. It's a lot of work and a lot of effort on their part. But as they do this, they kind of automate things and they perfect how that is done so they can package it up. They become the smarter, knowledgeable people on ransomware, sell it back down to the script kitties. Uh, and uh, let them go and run with it. So we saw um, kind of this was where ransomware took off. Got a few people that, that had perfected it, and then they started selling it. So now anybody can do ransomware. And so now you, then you saw ransomware explode, and now you're seeing the tactics change where ransomware is becoming more targeted. So it's not just kind of spray and pray anymore. It's like I'm going to hit you specifically, and I'm going to hit your company. Uh, and since I'm hitting your company, I'm not going to ask for three thousand dollars. I'm going to ask for so uh, right now we're kind of in a, in, a, in a spot where ransomware volume is reducing, but the uh, money that's being made on ransomware is increasing. All right, so Sergey's not rich. Um, you know, you might think, well, this is you know some guy getting rich off me. Uh, he's not. Um, he doesn't mind stealing your money because he's from an undeveloped country or a lesser developed country. And we're all from the richest country on the planet. And so he thinks, well, you kind of owe me money anyway. So he doesn't feel bad about stealing your money, but he's not making tons of money because there are thousands of surveys out there, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of surveys spread around the globe trying to do the same thing. 
he's doing at some level. Some people are smarter than others. Some people don't get anything out of it. Some people it's you know a failed venture, but other people will scam certain people. They can make it you know small time. Some people even do go through that um, sort of growth progress, and they'll make it a little bit better. Um, one of the uh, um, uh, recent kind of big ransomware families, uh, Grandcrab, Gamecrab, the mark, um, was, um, uh, <laughs> kind of, it was, it was a, a, a scourge that everybody hated, and we would, you know, somebody would break it, and then the people that created it would just make a new one. So, you know, there was like version numbers and versioning and everything. Um, and they finally said, hey, look, we've made enough money. We've made like two to three million dollars. We're good. We're going to shut it down. Here's all the keys to the ransomware, so we don't care anymore. Around. So that it shows you exactly what I was talking about earlier. They don't really care about the crap. They just care about the money. They got their two to three million dollars off of it, as they said. I know if they did or not. But they got their two to three million dollars off of it. They're done. So they went off and did something else. They got tired of maintaining it, just got what they could and, and ran. Um, but it's hard for him uh, to also to move that money. Um, if you try to do anything with Bitcoin, you know, it's hard to get into Bitcoin and it's hard to get out of Bitcoin anymore. You used to be able to sell it um, very easily, um, getting into a, a, an exchange or getting out of an exchange. But it's become harder and harder as U.S. banks and credit cards won't let you buy that place. What's that? Oh, yeah, and people who do it with open source intelligence. Like, so if you buy or sell Bitcoin, I can go look up that Bitcoin wallet and see where that money's coming in and out. I might not necessarily be able to associate it to you, but I can see where those transactions are taking place. And then if you do, you know, to cash it out, you've got to go through a you know, regular bank that deals with fiat currency, you know, dollars, pounds, whatever. Um, and if, if I'm law enforcement tracking you and you do cash it out at some bank like that, I can physically go to that bank and I can ask them, who was this dude? Let me see your security cameras. Or, you know, does this guy have an account here? Um, again, in lesser developed countries, that might not be as, um, you might not be able to track that as um, positively as you could um, in a more developed country. But there is. Else do more. Go get the money. Yeah, yeah, they do that. But then there's, I mean, there's also other ways. There's a, there's a very creative scheme that a lot of the places will use when they have large amounts. They kind of multiplex, or they de or they multiplex, demultiplex, multiplex, demultiplex. So they'll, you know, say if you've got a hundred dollars, they will pass it out in dimes to a bunch of other Bitcoin wallets, and then they collect it back into one. And so it's kind of like a weird Bitcoin cryptocurrency laundering method. You know, instead of putting it into, um, you know, a casino or rental properties or you know whatever you do to launder money. I don't <laughs> Don't rest me, please. <laughs> um, but I, you know, it's uh, I'm like the guy in office space. You know, I was trying to sell magazines. I don't know how to launder money. So, but um, but they, you know, they've just got creative ways that are unique to cryptocurrency, where they try to obfuscate the transactions and move them around uh, so that you don't necessarily see them. So if you kind of put them in a, you know, if you throw a little bit of water in a river, you can't figure out what water you threw in the river too long. Yep. Yeah. You, you can go between the different cryptocurrencies. You can even, I mean, in in the same one, you can move it to. You know, you can take hundred dollars and you can move it to a thousand wallets, back into one wallet, back into a thousand wallets, back into one wallet. You can mix other things in there. You know, there's just creative ways that are unique to cryptocurrency um, that will allow you. But he still does better than what he would have, or he does anything at all in a country that might have high unemployment and he had very low job prospects. So how can you stop surrogate surrogate? So these are should be fairly um, fairly easy to look at, but yeah, that's a good, good idea. But the first two, always think before you click, stop a minute, slow down. Don't just automatically click through things. Microsoft has conditioned us to click yes, 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 yes to get through something. We need to undo that. So, I mean, even a microsecond wait will allow you to be skeptical about what you're clicking on. When that email comes in from your bank, 
is it really from your bank? When an email comes in from Dropbox, from Office 365, from DocuSign, is it really from any of those places? When you get that email from Paul Gower, is it really from Paul Gower? <laughs> it's probably from Shell. Um, so always be skeptical. I mean, you don't have to be paranoid. You don't have to be conspiracy theory. But just stop for a minute and go, is this really from my bank? Let me look through it. Let me hover over a link. Let me see who the, the front tag is actually, uh, who the front, the front email is actually from. Uh, take extra care of social media. Thomas, I think you mentioned that a minute ago. Social media? Somebody did. Sorry, I was taking that. No, no, you're safe. Um, always uh, or take extra care on social media. There's so many different avenues um, that people could do that. The, um, the you know put a decal in your car and you can get money. Well, that's obviously a scam. They're just looking for some kind of information from you. Well, they did like what you're saying. Uh, the whole podcast was this um, kind of like the bank you're writing in on the access. They paid them this lady a check. She was looking at a different bank account with more money. She withdrew the money, sent it back to them. And then when she looked at her bank account, it was less. Yep. And then they blackmailed her saying, you've already broken the law once, you're going to keep doing this. And yep. so, like we say so. Basically. That's a common scam, especially for things like if you're selling on eBay or something like that. Oh, I'm sorry, I accidentally sent you more. Did you cash and send me that back? Mm -hmm. Well, it wasn't a legit check in the first place. So you're cashing a, uh, a fraudulent check and you're sending the money back. You cash it on your account, so it's going to go against your account. So you're going to be for the problem. Um, all sorts of other things. I mean, even down to you're answering those questionnaires on email. You know, those start to sound a lot like your forgotten password questions uh, for your bank. Um, you should be a little worried there. If it starts to reveal too much information about you, you know, what is your address? What GPS coordinates are you at right this very minute? You know, uh, all those kind of things. We think about that and it sounds silly, but um, a lot of these sound innocuous, but they aren't necessarily innocuous. Uh, have good password hygiene. So, first and foremost, never, ever, 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 ever reuse a password. If you use a password in one place, don't use it in another place. Um, how do you remember those passwords? You get a password manager. If you have a thousand passwords, you can't possibly remember all of those. Have a password manager. Use something like LastPass or Bitwarden or 1Password or any of the plethora that are out there. Uh, also, in that password manager, use the random password generator function. In um, your easy to remember Bank of America password will be a whole lot more secure if it's 50 characters of gibberish that you can't remember rather than fluffy dog 12. Um, so use that random, you know, that, gen that generator. Um, my mom texted me the other day and asked me what my Netflix password is because I hook it up on their TV for my nephews to watch when they're over. Um, but um, I sent her the you know, gibberish password there. She's like, whoa, what is that? I was like, all oh, my passwords are just randomly generated. She's like, oh, okay, good. Um, but go through, especially if you, if you do use a password manager and you get all your passwords in there, a lot of the password managers will also have tools in there to say, which ones are you reusing? So you can go through there uh, and you can say, you know, show me the ones I'm reusing. And then you can just go through and methodically change them. In some cases, the password manager will have functionality in there that says, you know, just go randomly change this for me. And it goes and, and it has it knows the website. It's a structured website, um, so it knows what it needs to send, and then it can change your password and store that new password for you. So you don't really have to do a whole lot. You don't have to remember passwords anymore. These things are ubiquitously available. They're browser plugins. It's cloud based. They're encrypted before you send them. The the, the password manager company doesn't know what it is. It has to be encrypted by you. Um, and you want to use for that. When you can't use a password manager, use a long passphrase. So there's a there's a XKCD, a, a, a fairly nerdy um, web comic that um, there's one on this where they talk about the difference between a super complex password and then you know something very simple like they use correct course battery stable. That's a long password. You can see that. It's a long, it's a long password that nobody's going to be able to guess because well, everybody will be able to guess that one because it's in a web comic. But something like that, nobody is able to guess. I use one when I do um, security awareness presentation for my clients. Um, I use one that says, "My nephew James loves guacamole," and you have to know my family to know that. I don't use that as a password, but it's just a good example. Um, 
you'd have to know my family, and you'd have to know I have a nephew named James who will eat guacamole with a spoon. But most of the time, none of you people would know that unless I told you that. Um, so come up with something like that. Um, use that for your password manager's password itself. Use that for your logins to your computers uh, and for other things if you can't use a password manager. Keep your systems uh, and software updated. You hate that? Set it on automatic. Um, set the hours so that there's some time in the middle of the night. Leave your laptop open overnight. Uh, leave it plugged in and open. Make sure that this kind of stuff happens. When Sergey is sending you emails that have links in them to go download software or he's got a malicious attachment on there, what he's betting on is that you have a piece of software on your computer that's not updated. So make sure your operating system is updated through your automatic patching. Uh, make sure that all your third-party apps, like your Adobe's and your Java's, are all updated. Um, make sure you close your browser and reopen it occasionally. Most browsers will automatically update themselves when you do that. Um, that is uh, a majority of, of what will solve your problem there, is by doing that. Uh, and then have antivirus. We dog on antivirus all day long because it's been around for a while, but it still catches all the low main fruit. Um, make sure you have that, make sure it's updated. Um, don't use the free version unless it's a mic the Microsoft free version that comes with uh, Windows. Um, actually pay for it. Uh, if you don't pay for something, you're the product not compliant. Just keep that in mind. It's like Google. Google's selling your information because you're not paying for Gmail. Same thing with Antivirus. They're collecting information off of you as payment for their software. So uh, unless it's the built-in stuff for Microsoft, uh, go pay the 30 bucks a year to get a, a good one. And it usually comes with a lot more features too. It's not just the basic antivirus. It will have like ransomware protection and other things. And that will help you keep Sergey on your phone. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so I already talked about this a little bit. Um, I did pitch TechFest a little bit for my TechFesty people over there. Um, tech, so Joel is on the 10th, 11th, uh, actually right now. 11th, 12th, 13th. 11th, 12th, and 13th, sorry. And uh, TechFest is on the 10th and 11th. Um, so Jolt's, uh, the cyber competition, Capture the Flag, for anybody that didn't, uh, uh, didn't hear that. Um, it's uh, pretty intense, but it's very community driven. It's not super competitive, <laughs> um, but it is a competition. Um, so I'm kind of contradicting everything and everything I've said here. But it's very much a, a team building and critical thinking exercise that's just in mass at one time. We feed you, there's lots of cool puzzles, there's lots of cool people there. Um, if you've got questions about that, give me a shout. If you want to sign up for it, talk to Ashley. Um, Tech Fest is a couple of days before that. It is two days of uh, conference talks, um, all sorts of information um, on uh, software development, uh, IT, cybersecurity, um, other like team builds, like like team focused things, so talks, you know, just talks on what it's like, you know, things that are important to people who work in technology. Um, this is the seventh year. Okay, the seventh year that that's gone on. Um, I, this is the first year I'm involved from being an, atten an attendee only. Um, but like, so I keep looking over at Paul and Shell. They are uh, they're uh, principal organizers uh, of that and have been in it from the beginning. <coughs> We've got a great uh, technology community from every aspect, great developer community, uh, great cybersecurity community here in Central Arkansas, and these are just events that are like culminations of those um, communities coming together. So I highly encourage you to participate in that if you have any interest in that. That's all I got. If you guys got questions, I'm happy to answer. Still some of those password keepers. Um, I know they often will send out which is helpful also, they send out these notices about data breaches, which is good to know uh, as an enforcer. Uh, and having been an employee at the Attorney General's office, I know that works. But here, you mentioned cloud-based storage of those. If that's all safe from your point of view, to relinquish those passwords yeah. after they file? It's as safe as anything else. Um, actually, it's more safe than anything else. Um, there's a couple of caveats that I throw in there. So the companies that do these, the ones I recommend, that's their bread and butter. Um, I use LastPass as an example. Um, it's um, it's a, a very well-developed tool. 
Um, there's a guy that works for Google. His job is to hack things. He loves to go hack LastPass. And the LastPass people will usually go, yes, come on, send not, so we can fix it. Um, so they're, they, when, when something happens there, they're typically very responsive and they fix things kind of Johnny on the spot. Uh, they're not your bad examples about when hacks happen, like Equifax and different places that try to deny it and berate you for doing things. <coughs> they're usually very responsive to that sort of thing, and they won't take any sort of um, anything like that that happens. Um, I also said that when these things are stored in the cloud, they're encrypted from your end, and then they're in stored on the cloud. So you encrypt them, and then they're stored up there. So even if they are hacked, there is the minutest of chance that any real sensitive information is going to get out. Um, the risk is not zero. The risk in using anything is not zero. Um, but the risk is extremely low, especially if you're using uh, one of the more industry recommended ones because they've usually been vetted. They're well liked by security people. Um, uh, Good stuff. 
know, I, I use the example um, that I, there's a there's a service called uh, Have I Been Pwned uh, that's offered by Telenet Australia, and it's just a collection of all of the data breaches you can get its hands on. So if you drop an email address in there, it'll tell you, hey, you were in an Adobe breach, you were in a LinkedIn breach, you were in this breach. Um, there's a site that I have, um, uh, I found on the darknet that I can go in and say, okay, now I can see that you're in that breach, and I can also see that your password is kittycat123. Um, and I'll use that with my clients to say, because a lot of people will reuse passwords. So, you know, I might look up a client's email and I say, oh, your password is, you know, RKLMOP237. Have you used that password anywhere else? Um, go change it at that point. So I get a little bit more information out of something like that. It can be used nefariously, but I use it to protect the client. Um, there are other things in there that, like, you know, maybe people are in uh, a country that's, um, you know, very oppressive. You know, they're in a media blackout country or something where stuff's not getting out. They're in Venezuela or Turkey. You know, they're in Hong Kong now. And they want to use something like Tor to get access to um, news that's not um, uh, heavily curated, you know, or, you know, state, you know, thumb and all that stuff. Or they're trying to communicate out what it's really like. So get out pictures, get out videos, get out statements or something like that so that the local uh, government can address people and keep it still. So there's a billion different use cases for all of that. In general, they're all a little bit more secure, but you really can't look at anything and go, this is secure. There's not an absolute secure. I, I used to use the example that um, the most secure computer on the planet is Cased in concrete and dropped into the ocean. But then, like James Cameron and Bob Ballard, just like tool by a little submarine and they can chip away the concrete and get into it, etc. Even that isn't totally secure. And it's completely useless at that point because it's underwater. Yeah.